So before work increased in your shop, you probably thought your processes and procedures were pretty dang good. You didn't really have any redos and things were going wonderful. And then this happened where most shops are bombarded with work. Some are scheduled out for months and we're finding that we have like redos and mistakes and issues galore. Well, this is a production problem and a process problem. Don't you agree? On today's episode, we have my good buddy, Michael Giorizzo, and I asked him to come on because we all need some help when it comes to running our shops more lean so that we can be more productive, get things done easier, faster, and make more money. So anyway, stay tuned. Listen to what Michael's got to say. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. Such good, great, actually, takeaways for every shop listening. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'm going to stop ranting. Stay tuned. Welcome to Body Bangin', your podcast for all things body. Auto body, that is. And now, introducing Body Bangin's host, Mickey Woods of Mickey Woods Marketing. Mickey is a former Auto Collision Center owner and is now a marketing and business development expert to shops across the globe. Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Body Bangin'. I am so happy to have you back on listening to another episode. And today we have a treat for you. We have all been struggling with so many cars in our shop. We were at a point where we were like, oh, please, we need cars. We're dying for cars in the drive. And now we have the reverse problem. It's like, make it stop. (laughs) We've got so many. What do we do with it? So I reached out to a friend of mine, Michael, you may know him, Michael Giorizzo, and he's going to talk with us today on a couple of things that I think are going to help out shops, no matter where you are, whether you're on the west side of the U.S., the east east coast, your north, south, Canada, wherever you're at. Some things that we're going to talk about today are literally takeaways for every shop, every shop. And I'm excited to have you on, Michael. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be on. Yeah. So if you don't know Michael, he has literally been in the industry since the womb. <laughs> <laughs> the lifer, life sentence. Yeah, yeah. His grandfather actually started in the business. And so he literally grew up and it passed to his father and he's in it. His his sons are in it. I mean, your whole family now, right? You're You're bought in, like it or not. Yeah, yeah, we're in now. We kind of all grew up with it. My sisters have a separate company, but we do have family involved in, in this company. But like I said before, I like to say I'm a lifer. It's really been through two employments. One, a family business that ultimately was sold to Sterling, mm-hmm. and uh, then uh, then starting this in 04. So it's really been two employments. But the core of of really being in the industry started from birth, like you said, started from the womb. Yeah. Well, and it's great. And we won't get into all the specific of Michael's journey, but just know really what he and his family started working on was lean process before kind of the industry even took on lean processing as a whole. And so he really got into processes and procedures that kind of became his thing. And you ended up having how many stores underneath you? It was like so many. So we had four, uh, four stores that were family stores and we were process oriented, but we really didn't understand the formality uh, of it and the principles behind lean manufacturing. But that company was acquired in 99 through the first feeding frenzy of, ac- you know, of acquisitions that were going on. And, and that was, uh, we were acquired by Sterling Auto Body Centers. And then a couple of years later, found myself uh, being asked to run the company. And we were 30 some stores at that point in eight markets and really helped to grow it and lead it in, into 11 markets and 65 stores. So it was wow. a small guy, from, small body shop guy from Northeast Ohio. And all, now all of a sudden thrown into this new world. And, you know, some of you may remember that Allstate Holdings actually acquired that business. And so I ran that company through a couple of years of that incredible experience, you know, no yeah. regret. I don't want to repeat it, but no regret. <laughs> a lot of learning, I'm sure, during that time. Oh, great education. 
Yeah. Well, that's incredible. And so knowing a little bit about Michael and his experience, gosh, learning the hard way, I'm sure so many things you learned by trial and error. And now he's got the company DCR Systems and really they pride themselves on the processes and procedures that they've got going on, really being as lean as possible. So I wanted Michael to come on and share some things with everybody that he's doing that could be some solid takeaways for you all to take back to your shop, to be able to do a little bit differently, a little bit better. I see a lot of shops just really struggling and almost falling over their own feet in a process that they thought they had that was high functioning. And then you have all the pressure of all these vehicles coming in all at once. And you realize maybe we're not as efficient as we thought we were. (laughs) So Michael's going to chit chat with us today, you know, and I want to kind of start us out with talking about a key point that Michael and I spoke about originally when we talked and he said, you know, Mickey, I feel like we have a big responsibility that the industry is really not paying much attention to. We forget about it. So Michael, I'll let you say what you, what you and I were talking about. Yeah. So, you know, safe and proper repair is, I think, something that most of us talk about, right? We all want a safe and proper repair. But I think something that gets often forgotten or missed in that equation is that if we are responsible for making uh, the customer uh, whole after that that loss, that's going to be, that's going to include a vehicle that upholds the maximum amount of value that it can after the accident, even though we know a vehicle fixed perfectly is going to have a degree of diminished value. Yeah. So, so we have a responsibility there. And, you know, so that responsibility, I think oftentimes gets overlooked when it, you know, when it comes to determining methodology and even part selection on these vehicles. And so inside of our company, pride ourselves on our cause, really what we do and why we do it, right? Our yeah. why. Yeah, and, um, and for so for us, that's really important the pre- uh, the proper and safe repair, but also one that upholds the maximum amount of value that it can after the accident. Like I said, even though we we know a perfectly repaired vehicle will have a degree of diminished value, yeah. we really take responsibility in trying to maximize that value that it's going to maintain. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because, like you said, we hear it at all the conferences we go to, and we are constantly try to be reminded of the safe and proper repair because that I feel like is a number one in our minds as a former shop owner I know I lost sleep about it thinking gosh are my techs even repairing these vehicles like they're supposed to be how do I know that they are and and there's that burden of that and that responsibility for that but there's also this responsibility that you're talking about is maintaining the value of the vehicle And we don't talk about that very often, but it's so true. So I'm so glad that you brought that up. Yeah, you know, so just simple things like, you know, a lot of decisions are made when it comes to repairing panels. Can it be repaired? And right, and we're body shop people. We can repair anything. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But really the question that should be answered is should it be repaired? You right. know, so much of the panel and the contour of that panel and the beauty, what we what we view as beauty lines are actually structural lines. Are, right. And they're part of the what makes up the structural integrity of that vehicle. So you take a quarter panel, and although you may make a lot of money repairing the quarter panel that probably technically shouldn't be repaired, you also have to consider, you know, are you compromising the structural integrity of that vehicle? Right. And, it's not about, you know, am I comprom- compromising it too much? Am I compromising it at all? Right. Because it, it's part of the makeup of it. And it's part of what gets absorbed, absorbed that energy in the next accident. Yes, 100%. Now, what do you think, I'm going to take you in a little bit of a different direction, is now that we have this parts restriction issue, not restriction. Well, there is restriction for some structural parts for non-certified shops. So we've got that issue, but thinking about just in general, having a lack of access to parts. So you have shops fixing things that they might normally have replaced just because they can't get the part. So how does that kind of play into it? Because now we're in a little different environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, we're, we're faced with that as well. And we've narrowed it down to, if it's a, if it's not a safety related part, and it can be repaired and allow the vehicle to get back on the road and with the safe and proper repair, that's fine. But if it's safety related and we're compromising that at all, yeah, it, it is what it is. And right. we're, 
and we're going to have to wait. So that, that's some of the stuff that's really not in our control. The decisions that we make are in our control. And, and there, there are far too many decisions being made right now in the industry that have that in mind. Okay, we're kind of looking maybe the other way. Or we're not really acknowledging, am I compromised? Yeah. Uh, this vehicle structurally in any, any way, repairing that part versus replacing it. Right, right. So another totally different question. See, I told you I'd have questions for you. Ah. You weren't going to be ready for <laughs> we love it. Uh, okay, so because your process, your process guy and your shops are known for being super process oriented. Now with this parts issue that we're having, let's talk about it a little bit more. Are you pre-ordering parts then? How are you handling cars when they're coming in knowing that you could totally disassemble a vehicle and then it's got to sit for six months because of one part? Like, how are, how are you handling that? Great, great question. Because we've had to readjust some of our thought process without compromising really what we stand for. Yeah. So if we've got a vehicle that's a drivable vehicle and it's got damaged parts that need to be replaced and it's not safety related stuff, and we can do even a partial disassembly identifying with a high degree of uh, confidence that we've identified all the parts. Yeah. Um, we'll do a number of things, like a lot of photos, that type of thing, to give us that, that kind of a virtual mirror matching capability. And we will what we call secure parts. So we, we try and use terms that are different than the industry. So pre-ordering, <laughs> yeah. securing, really similar. But yeah. securing the part means when you tell me we're going to see it, we will schedule the vehicle and we'll make them match so that we're not being a custodian of parts orders that could get lost or broken or damaged. Or right. anything like that. And we want the vehicle to be there in a timely fashion also because Ultimately, we want to mirror match those parts. Yeah. Right. And we all have had experience where they're boxed incorrectly or they come in slightly damaged, or maybe it just was interpreted incorrectly in the right. order. Yeah. The, you know, and it's not the right part. So we want to have, we, we utilize things virtually like, you know, photos or even videos to help us in that pro process. And it's got to be select because there's no sense in securing or pre ordering whatever you, whatever term you want to use those parts if you can't have a high degree of confidence that you have you've identified them all yeah absolutely well and another thing uh, well for everybody that's listening dcr systems typically their shops operate within dealership so you're lucky michael because you and your team have a really close relationship with the dealership when it comes to ordering parts and things like that and so potentially because and i say that because some of my shops are like gosh we're out so much money because we've got to get all the parts up front and then we're waiting on parts. So it's like the amount of money that you're out having to host and hold all of these parts and you don't even have the vehicle where then I have some other shops that have great relationships with the dealership. So the dealership will earmark those parts and hold them for the, for the shop so that it's not like an outlay of money before you got the car in the shop. So I assume you guys are probably doing something more like the latter yeah, well, I mean, technically we are an independent, but we co-brand with the dealer and we have a strategic relationship with them. It's a contractual right. uh, relationship. At the same time, we're going through the same things. Right. So we have to think outside the box and how, how do we make this work? And, you know, with our dealer partners, you know, even though they may be under uh, one name and one uh, overall branding, they may have multiple franchises and, and they all operate a little bit different. But, you know, a lean principle is really getting to closely tied to your supply chain. Yeah. And so really getting to know those folks, explaining what's important to us, explore, you know, and why it's important because it's important to the customer. Right. And then, and then creatively thinking about and brainstorming, okay, how can we get better at this? Yeah. And it's amazing actually, when you put your heads together with the supply chain, that even just the littlest of things could make things just a few things a, a bit easier. Maybe get a couple car, more cars delivered, cars back in customers' hands. Right, right. Now, one thing that you and I did talk about, and I preach this a lot <laughs> for my, everybody listening that knows me, they're like, we know, Mickey. There are a lot of, so many advantages that we have as independent and small MSOs that we have that the big guys, the big consolidators don't have. And there, I feel like there's a myriad of things that we, we are, we're so lucky that we can be nimble where they can't be. So you and I were talking about how right now is a great time actually for that. When we're talking about being more lean in the shop, do you want to talk about that for a quick minute? 
Sure. You know, you know, people um, talk about, you know, how's, how does the industry, how's the industry going? How's the business going? And, and, and I just say, you know, very, very uh, candidly, it's a great time to be in the industry because <laughs> if you're in the industry right now and you want to get out, perfect time, right? The multiples right. are probably the highest in history, right? Yes. You can find somebody that wants to pay the price that you want if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. If you're not, and you can think outside the box and refine the way that you compete, there are things as a single store operator, even small MSOs that we can do that the big multi hundred store network can't do or, or can't do near as quick or simply won't have the courage uh, to do. They simply won't have the courage because it's going to be too disruptive. Right. So putting processes in place, you know, especially around quality control and putting out a consistent product, really changing the way that maybe work is done on your shop floor, whether if you want to convert to a team environment or just something, putting something in as basic as, you know, call it blueprinting, repair planning, damage analysis. What There's a bunch of names out there, but yeah. it's the whole process by which we commit a ton of resources up front to try and get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, and I talk about uh, on the industry and even to our, our stores, uh, remind them of this, you know, this exercise that they could do with their teams. It's, it's actually a lot of fun and it's pretty powerful. You know, you have a little pizza lunch or whatever lunch and learn on a whiteboard and put it out to your team. Hey, if we only had one shot, that's it. We got one shot to get this plan right for this vehicle. Mm -hmm. What would we do? What would be everything that we would need to do? And you start listing them out. Yeah. And it's amazing, you know, because those lists will be very similar, but you have to kind of really probe the team and say, okay, mm -hmm. you know, you know, what about structurally? Well, okay. Well, if we want to be hundred percent sure, we better, we better measure it. Right. 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 And, and sometimes even in repair plan, pull it up front. If we've determined yeah. if related parts are repairable or not, you know, what about color match? Mm -hmm. we have one shot, right? We got to get our color match up front in repair plan or in blueprinting, whatever. So how do we go about that? You know, what, what variants are we putting on this car and where? Right. So to really just get into a discovery mode more than anything else and saying, hey, we're going to discover everything up front. And you have to think about it. We discover everything ultimately anyways, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes not at the, the most right. appropriate time, right? Yeah. Uh, when, when poor Mrs. Smith's on her way and we realize we got the wrong taillight. Right, uh, right. <laughs> that never happens. No. Uh, yeah. But no, but if you if you you know go at it with your team and you build a set of steps or standards just from that, just from that whiteboard activity, first of all, your people, they know <laughs> what needs to be done to get yeah. it right. Right. If you can build something around that, your business will inherently become more lean, will become lean production like. And the reason I say that because you know, lean is about reduction of waste. So people that say, Oh, that doesn't work, that's that's the silliest thing in the world. It's the execution that doesn't work because lean principles are sound and make sense and they're so right. simple and logical. It's about stripping out unnecessary waste. Yeah, well, one of the big pieces of waste that plague us in our industry are redundant activity. Totally. Air the car down, write an estimate, right? Get parts, start on the car, stop, write a supplement, yes, order more yes. parts, right? get approved. I mean, but start, stop, stop. You know, every time, every supplement is essentially rework, right? Yes. And we look at rework and, you know, as a repair that needs to be redone. Well, that's part of it. And and typically the paint and the color match gets the bad rap when we think of rework in our industry. Right. But when you think about it from a process standpoint, it's any time we have to do the work again. Mm -hmm. so first time quality, you know, when lean principles are just so basic and so simple, it's about really lining up the steps and doing them one time, lining them up in sequence right. one time. Right. Simple, not easy. Yeah. It takes a ton of discipline. Right. But, you know, it's like if, if you ask just anybody out there, the general public, how would you design the collision repair industry? Well, they would say something like, well, okay, diagnose my vehicle correctly the first time, right? Yeah. Order all the parts, 100% of them the right. first time, right? Receive them, verify them for cor cor 
correctness and then tell me when I'm getting my car back. Right. right? It, it, well, it is that simple, but simple doesn't mean easy because you've right. got to put standards in place and yeah. painstaking disciplines in place that need to be executed every time to even have a chance of that being the result. Right. Hey, would you like to increase the number of cars in your drive? Well, look no further. The Mickey Woods marketing team provides collision center specific marketing. We use proven techniques to not only increase your sales, but put money in your pocket. Visit us at collisioncentermarketing.com or you can find my personal contact information in the show notes. And let's get your 2022 off to a body banging start. Well, and I love the word that you said, discovery. It's such a cool thing because I think what we miss out oftentimes in shops is we've got like these fragmented pieces of shop, you know, of the shop where, you know, the paint department is operating just within the paint departments. And we've got the techs and they're out, they're just so focused on what they're doing. And then we've got the writers. And so everybody's kind of in their little box. And I think we forget when we come together as a team, which what you're suggesting, which I love, it helps us to also become aware because we get so caught up like in everyday life of what we're doing. This is my job. This is what I'm doing. Where I think sitting down with the team and talking about all the different layers of what's going on, again, the discovery helps. What? How are we going to discover together how to be better? And then also the concept of teamwork, building everybody. And, and then you get the buy-in because how are you going to change principles and procedures in a shop if you don't have buy-in on it? Especially if you're going to go change something from what they're used to doing. Well, especially because the people doing the work are the ones that have the best new ideas, right? They're the ones right. that the yeah. type of work. It, it's again, it's one of the eight forms of waste, untapped human potential. Totally. You let it by the wayside, yet they're the ones that are doing the work every day. And you, you can almost guarantee they have an improvement idea in their mind that either they're afraid to say something mm. about, or maybe you th- they think it just won't matter, right. you know, that, that type of thing. But the people touching the work are the ones that will actually improve your process. Yeah. Well, and, and discovery then also for the managers and the owners, because they're, we, I think oftentimes our egos, and I will just speak for myself as a former owner, you know, we constantly are battling our ego of, well, this is, you know, this is the right way. And this is what I've come up with. And I spent so much time on this. And so therefore we must adhere to it. Where if you can put aside your ego to hear what your people are telling you, they're the ones in the trenches. They're the ones coming up with these issues. Talk about discovery, a discovery for our own selves, you know, and for the team. So I think, I think the whole concept is amazing. If this is a great takeaway that I hope everybody listening will go back to their shops and take the time, if nothing else, like you were saying, just do a shop lunch, bring in something and have everybody just make it a powwow. Let's let's sort this out. What does that look like? And then what would we have to do to make changes? And it doesn't have to be, you know, obviously we're not going to just revamp everything in one lunch, but at least it starts the process. Okay, well, let's start out with this one thing and let's tweak it. Let's do that one thing. And then let's do another lunch. Okay. And then we do the next thing. You know, I, it's a process where I think when you, a lot of people think about it, it seems very overwhelming. I don't want to change anything because if I change this, then that changes that, and then that changes that. And then, oh my gosh, and <laughs> it just feels like it's too much. Yeah. You know, when as humans, we're naturally change adverse, right? Right. right? right. We don't like, we don't like change. And so that, poses a bit of, uh, of a challenge just out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, but what an opportunity today to really refine the way that we compete mm. in a way that the big MSOs, the, you know, the multi-hundred store networks can't even think of doing right now, especially when it comes to the back-end process. And this is where I think that the opportunity is. You have all these consolidation efforts out there and some that we've heard about for a decade or so. And then all these new kids on the block, private equity equity going crazy Mm -hmm. and everyone claiming to be new and different. None of them have changed the back end. Mm. 
Now I'm going to change that back end and the complexity of the vehicles is going to drive that change. And the reason none of them have changed it thus far, because it hasn't become painful yeah. for them. It right. hasn't. It's still a profitable model when you're handing vehicles off as an assignment individually. Whether, mm-hmm. And there is kind of a underlying and overlying quality standard that you're trying to get in place, but really no formal quality verification where you're going to say, okay, the vehicle stops five times during the process to have very specific quality control checks, mm-hmm. right? And those done by many different eyes mm-hmm. and complementary skills and getting the people to work like that for that that cause, you know, obviously it changes the way that maybe you have to compensate. It, it may or may not have to change that, but getting everybody to rally around what's important and that is the customer yeah, and the environment, right? The environment right. for the people and, and, and the, the product that we're going to consistently div- deliver to the customer, that's what's important. And that's where, you know, as smaller operators and the, the big multi-hundred networks, we can make those changes. We can tweak our business. You know, we can really refine the way that we compete so that our product is much more consistent because the pain that will come out, unfortunately, it's just a matter of time. The pain that will come out is the improper repair. Yeah. And it's not the intention of any of these big, big boxes, but it's the inconsistency in the way the product goes through the system that will deliver that. And, you know, What's it take? I don't, only a couple out of a hundred that go out on the road unsafe and have a problem after that. Yeah, you know, and now the pain starts in, in more ways than one. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And you touched on something very important: is the complexity of the vehicles. Uh, and you and I both know, and everybody listening to this knows it that the complexity of vehicles continues to get greater and greater. It's yeah, it's <laughs> it's crazy. So when you're not doing something, and I think that's exactly what we've learned now with shops thinking that their process was pretty good. And then you get this big push of work and realizing we are inundated and the process we had is not as good as we thought. You know, it's like a, a leak in a pipe. And you know, when there's a little bit of water, it's just a couple drips, no big deal. When you Then when you turn that water on, that spigot on full speed, now that thing's spraying, you're like, I didn't realize that hole was so big. <laughs> exactly. There's one way to expose your flaws, and that's overload the system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> them in a hurry. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that these highly technological vehicles is going to be another way, another way to expose the issues. I, I spoke to one of our uh, local vocational schools in Ohio earlier in the week. And I uh, spoke to the students there, just a great group of uh, young students. And Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and I said to him, I said, you know, the number one skill today in closure repair, and they all threw out, you know, different hand skills and reading. reading. It's reading. And in some of our most veteran technicians are the ones we have to remind most often. Yeah. Because Great point. It, matters, it doesn't matter that they may have done that bumper on that similar vehicle a month ago. It could have changed. Right, technology yeah. in that bumper. The repair procedures are chasing the technology. They change all the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, dating myself and growing up in the business where you dove into the vehicle with your experience and your tools. It's yeah. a different ballgame. Now it's about research. It's yes. about reading. It's about, you know, getting a game plan. It's about understanding the sequence things that uh, come off. You know, it's understanding how things come off without breaking most thing, most either whether it be trim or components come off without breaking yeah or can i should say can yeah. come off yeah 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 so it's, it, it, one of the most important skills is the the willingness to actually to read yeah and today we have the, today we have the manufacturers that are willing to give us the information yeah yeah where you know, again dating myself you know it was times in the in my career where you couldn't find the information. Yeah. You couldn't get it. Totally. So now, you know, it's a, it's, that's what I said, it's a wide open opportunity. Mm-hmm. A wide open opportunity because, because as small, nimble businesses in comparison to the multi hundred store network, we can do things, we can make change, we can adjust, we can improve at a rate that they, they can't even think about. Yeah. Yeah. 
I love that. So can I ask you another question while I've got you on the call, which is another pain point that we're dealing with is how are being a lean shop, how do you then deal with it when it comes to insurance and insurance claims and talking about, you know, when it takes me there because you're talking about reading and the importance of manufacturer procedures and all that kind of stuff, which Mm -hmm. then just my brain immediately goes to (laughs) insurance. (laughs) <laughs> right and time and time is money and yeah yeah getting yep. get, getting the customer the proper reimbursement well a couple of things that we we've done and this is something right now we're right in the middle of these challenges because we moved away from direct repair or preferred list seven eight nine years ago something like that and but that posed another set of challenges because in the that drp world the preferred list world you're essentially handling the claim, right? So you don't have that kind of wrestling going back and forth, trying to get a claim settled on behalf of the customer, you know, so that you can deliver the vehicle. So we we moved away from DRPs and and then throughout the last several years, we're trying to come up with really a solution. How do we deal with that? And so we've developed some internal software, which is, we believe is going to be really game-changing here in the future. So we're working on it internally, but we have it in play with our stores right now for about a year where it's an electronic documentation of the entire claim. Mm. Not only needs to be done, what was actually done. Yeah. So it it brings up everything from position statements, photos, videos, uh, invoices, if you need them, anything you need and evidence for whatever that line item is. So if you're you're dealing with the fender, it's going to have all the evidence. It's going to pull up automatically with that. So that's part of how, you know, how we, how we uh, deal with it. It's not bulletproof, but by any stretch of the imagination, and we make some pretty significant concessions. But what, what we do live by is that when we put a ton of resources and commit a ton of skills, equipment, space, and time into the repair plan of that vehicle, and every line item that we write, we believe and trust needs to be done and performed on that vehicle. Mm-hmm. That's, not, that's not negotiable. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't mean the price is non-negotiable, but the line right. item is non-negotiable. So getting drug into a line item discussion is kind of silly. Yeah, yeah. Silly. I mean, and especially when you have hundreds of insurers out there and they all have different guidelines and rules and flexibility or lack thereof. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. So we really take the approach as, hey, we're going to fix the vehicle this way and, and invoice it this way. Yeah. You know, we're willing to talk about a reasonable concession on behalf of the policyholder, but understand we're just a repair. We're essentially the neutral party. Right. With a huge responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, again, trying to refine the way that we compete without creating conflict, driving value to all stakeholders is really what we're after. It's not easy. It's not an easy course, yeah. but a huge, huge opportunity because of the change that's coming at us. And it's like you, like you mentioned. Complexity is not going away. Yeah. As we move forward, more and more cars will be connected. More and more cars will have 360 cameras. More and more, more and more vehicles will have all the advanced driving assist systems that you know uh, uh, the mainstream has. And so it's going to be become part of our world. And I've heard some st- statistics that within five years, 60% of the taken or something like that will be electronic resets, calibrations, you know, yeah, initi- that was initializations. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, a very, very changing world. But if we're on top of it, if our antenna's up, we can move a whole lot quicker than the big ships. <laughs> that's right. Thank goodness. Yeah, that's right. We're not moving the Titanic. Right. Yeah, I love it. Well, I don't want to, I could probably pick your brain for the next couple of hours. <laughs> and you can tell I don't like talking about this stuff either, right? <laughs> <laughs> so boring. No, I, I mentioned when we go to family, my dad's 84, right? And when uh, when we, our business, our family business was acquired in 99, part of it was he didn't have an extra strategy. And every dime he'd ever made, he put back into his family, into the business. Yeah. Well, he's 84 and he's at my sister's store every day. So the extra strategy did not work. <laughs> but when we come to family you know, events, my mom will say, okay, you go on that end of the table. You go on that end of the table. <laughs> No, it's kind of like, like what we like to talk about. So I know, I know. People think I'm nuts. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> business? Yes. They're like, really? 
we're having cocktails. And I'm like, yeah, it's one of my favorite <laughs> things to talk about. <laughs> They're crazy. Yeah. I, hey, love, I love it. It's, it's a blessing. I'm blessed. I love what I do. I love, I love Thank this you. industry. Well, let me just recap it for everybody listening. Cause we talked about a lot of incredible things. I think like we started out talking about the value of the vehicle. Let's remember that as collision centers, we have responsibility to maintaining the value of that vehicle. And like you said, can it be fixed or should it be fixed? And I think that's a really good question to be asking ourselves. And then the point that you made of right now is a time for great opportunity, for a great opportunity to be more efficient and be more lean. And a way that every shop could do it would be something as simple as shop lunch, sitting down and having a big powwow. And let's just get this up on the whiteboard and think about some ways. What would be the ideal way to fix a vehicle? Okay, then we'll just drill it down even more. What's one takeaway from this shop lunch that we could go do this week to go make a change? What, we, what are all the things that we need to do to make, make sure that we don't miss anything, that we've discovered everything up front? Yeah, yeah. so powerful, so powerful. Simple, and but not easy. <laughs> not easy, no. But, but I like the shop lunch because it's the team. The team, sure. you've got the input from the team, you've got the buy-in from the team versus the manager and the assistant manager had a meeting and they just came out and told us the, all everything that we're going to do to change. And it's like, and everybody's like, what the, what? <laughs> that yeah. always goes over really well. <laughs> and the, cool thing is, the cool thing is they know, right? They know how to do it. We right. just ask them. Tap into it. We just got to ask them. Yeah, I love it. So I'm sure everybody's going to leave this with the takeaway that really spoke to them. But I think those are, I mean, just some really powerful things today, Michael. I really appreciate you coming on the show and chit-chatting with me. It's so great to get to know you. Likewise, likewise. it's so great what you do uh, for the industry. you. You know, it's a time where we all need encouragement. Yeah. Uh, but it's an exciting time as well. I mean, tennis got to be up. But uh, yeah. people like yourself that really bring the in the know to the industry, just hugely Thank valuable you. to us. Thank oh, you. Thanks, Michael. Well, everybody, we're going to conclude today's episode of the Body Banging Podcast. And stay tuned next time. I don't know who's going to be on, but I can tell you it's going to be good. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> If you enjoyed today's show, make sure you hit the subscribe button. We have some incredible topics and guests coming your way you will not want to miss. If you are watching on YouTube and don't want to miss the latest and greatest, you'll want to hit the bell after subscribing so you will get a pop-up each time a video podcast goes live. To our devoted fans, would you mind paying it forward and sharing this little gem with someone else you think may benefit from it? Much love from all of us here at Body Bangin', all things Autobody.